name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. There are several lessons in the gospel for us today, which all relate to submitting to Christ's will for our life, rather than pursuing our own will. And the first relates to when we don't actually want Christ to heal us. We see that Christ heals the man, and the people in the surrounding areas ask Jesus to go away. Understood uh, symbolically, they can represent the parts of us that are resentful of what it might cost to follow Christ, what we might lose if Christ were to heal us. And these represent our inner divisions. Now, the demon-possessed uh, man used to haunt their region. He used to terrify them. He used to live in the graveyard. He was uncontrollable. And now he was healed. So they would have been partly thankful for that, but still they asked Christ to leave them. And perhaps it's the same with us. Maybe we want Christ to take away our anger, our bitterness, our unforgiveness, but we don't want him to take away our right to feel hurt, offended, or self-righteous. We want Christ to take away our enslavement to various lusts and pleasures, but we don't want to hear it when he says, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. We don't want to do the hard work of repentance. We beg Christ to have our pride taken away, but we don't want the humility and the abasement that comes with that. We ask Christ to give us his love for other people, but we don't want to extend that love to that one person in our life right now who is just, um, uh, just in, impossible and who we deem not worthy of our love. In other words, how often do we want what Christ has to offer, but on our own terms, not on his terms? And this is a certain pushing away of the Savior, much like the frightened villagers in the story today. Still, Christ leaves the man to be a witness to them. And this leads me to my next point about being effective witnesses to others. Father Philip Lamasters from the U.S. says that the healed man wanted to go away with Jesus. But that wasn't Christ's plan. He knew that the Gadarenes didn't understand the gospel. He knew that they were so disturbed by the amazing changes in the man's life that they couldn't hear the word of the Lord. So it was time for the Lord to leave, but the man who had been possessed by demons was to stay. For eventually, many, uh, for if, for, uh, eventually, people would see that the positive changes in this man were permanent. Over time, they would get to know him and accept him, and his new life would be living proof of Christ's salvation. He would be living evidence that God's blessing and healing have come even to demon-possessed Gentiles of whom everyone was terrified. Sometimes the best witness is in our sheer staying power, in just sticking it out, in doing the same things again and again over time. St. Paul himself needed time to convince the Christians that he had changed. In the epistle today, we read how lost and how blinded he was in his zealous pursuit of Judaism. And we can therefore understand how it was hard for the Christian uh, uh, community to accept him. Eventually, they did when the transformation within him convinced them. And that transformation proves itself over time. We probably all know someone who has impacted our lives, not through anything grand or spectacular, but just through being there, time after time, a constant presence of love. The writer Marianne uh, Evans, known uh, better by the pen name under which she wrote, George Eliot, in her work Middlemarch, tells of a certain Dorothea Kasabin who had an impact on just about every character in this story. And she writes of her that her full nature spent itself in channels which had no great name upon the earth, but the effect of her being on those around her was incalculably diffusive. For the growing good of the world is partly dependent on unhistoric acts and that things are not so ill with you and me as they might have been, is half owing to the number who lived faithfully a hidden life and rest in unvisited tombs. St. Paul urges something similar when he writes to the Thessalonians in his first letter to them, chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk properly toward those who are outside, and that you may lack nothing. There's a temptation, I think, to skip ahead in our spirituality, to try to race towards progress, or what St. John Climacus 
or St. John of the Ladder might call jumping all the rungs of the ladder in one go. We read about ceaseless prayer, about stillness, about dispassion, and we want them all immediately. We read about the feats of the martyrs and the saints, and we want to cover ourselves with the same glory. Or there's a temptation to be effective witnesses for Christ as soon as possible. And so we force religious talk in our conversations. We maintain hidden agendas in our friendships. We keep people around us as projects to be worked on. People feel this kind of subtle pressure and they resist it. The truth is that progress takes time. Behind the story of each martyr and each saint is countless hours of prayer, struggle, and intense inner work. One of the benefits that people have said has come out of lockdown is that people have had more time to cook. And slow cooking has been quite the thing, right? Many people who would perhaps just opt for microwave dinners or two-minute noodles are making things like roasted lamb shoulders and beef ragu. In orthodoxy, we find a kind of slow cooker spirituality. It takes time to build ourselves up in virtue, in prayer, in progress, it takes time for the Holy Spirit to be diffused in our lives, to use that word from Evans. How much better is a meal that we have taken the time to prepare rather than one of the quick options? Speaking of writers of the 19th century, Jane Austen's novels are good for this purpose too. I mean, they're good in general, but specifically for this point, to see the characters that are vindicated by the end, there are some that make a big splash and impress everyone initially. People like Wickham and Pride and Prejudice, Willoughby and Sense and Sensibility, the Bertram sisters in Mansfield Park. But after time, we see that they are false, shallow, even morally corrupted. And the characters that keep a quiet profile and steadily maintain integrity and honesty over time shine as the true heroes. When I was in a men's group, one of my friends wanted to uh, set up a proper men's organization here in Melbourne. And he contacted a long-standing organization in Queensland, asking if he could open a chapter of their group down here. And the response to him was, that's great. We welcome you. Contact us again in five years. And if you're still keen, then we can talk then. They knew that commitment will prove itself over time. So progress is slow in our faith, but it's not slothful. There's still movement. It's like bandaging a leg or an arm the right way. You have to do it slowly, not too fast, or you'll injure the limb further. But at, at the same time as bandaging slowly, you, you have to keep the bandage taut, right? There has to be some tension there, or else the whole thing just falls apart if it's too slack. But you can't be too tight either, or else it's constrictive. And so it is with our spirituality, a slow but steady, humble inner progress without pretense, without showiness, yet still taut, alert, vigilant. And this is most, uh, most effective in walking properly towards those who are outside, as St. Paul says. Now, this brings me to my final point about staying where we've been placed. Father Philip uh, goes on by saying that some are called to be itinerant evangelists, to travel from here to there, proclaiming the gospel. Some are called to be physicians, nurses, teachers, or development workers in faraway lands. But most of us are not. Most of us are called, like the man in today's lesson, to stay right where we are, among those who know us best, for good or for bad, to work out our salvation together with them. Our challenge is to accept with humility the family, the church community, the job, the school, the friends, the neighborhood, the blessings and the challenges that God in his providence has allowed us to face. If we think that the grass is always greener somewhere else, we will never learn that we are members of a body, that we are not isolated individuals, but members of one another in Christ. It is by bearing with one another that we work through our difficulties and learn to stop thinking simply in terms of our own desires and agendas, but in terms of what is best for others with whom we share a common life. Abba Moses used to tell his monks, go and stay in your cell. 
Your cell will teach you everything. And I think the same advice could be given to all of us. Our situation right now will teach us what we need to know. This restlessness for change, for a situation other than what we have, is something to be resisted. Gustave Flaubert in Madame Bovary writes that when she is bored with her married life and seeks adventure in an affair, she eventually gets bored with that too. And he writes this line. He says, she had rediscovered in adultery all the banality of marriage. We will carry our dissatisfaction with us wherever we go. If we are dissatisfied as single people, we will remain so as married. If we are dissatisfied in this country, we will probably remain so in another. If we're dissatisfied with how we look, we would probably remain so if we were to change it. Remaining steadfastly anchored where we've been placed and accepting our lot becomes a cross then on which our fantasy lives are crucified. And then we discover that the kingdom of God truly is within us here and now and not in some imagined place elsewhere. The link between these elements is submission to the will of God, submitting to his healing no matter what it might cost us, submitting to living quiet, slow and steady lives of upward progress without anxiety and hurry to achieve results, and submitting to where we've been placed, fully trusting that it is for our salvation that we are where we are, and more than that, the salvation of those around us too. May God help us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.